Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. Stan Osterman, coming to you live and direct from the beautiful megalopolis of Kailua, Hawaii. And uh, today is actually going to be one of my more challenging shows, and I'll explain that in a few seconds. Um, but uh, before we get into the show, I'd like to thank uh, everybody from Renew Rebuild Hawaii today uh, who helped us um, talk to Mayor Blangiardi about some of the county, city and county's big challenges and how they're going to use ARPA funds. Um, thanks to everyone for participating, and thanks to the mayor and his staff, and uh, Councilman Say and Mr. Formby from uh, the mayor's office for helping us make that a, a really great forum. I appreciate it. Like I said, today's going to be a, a the best way I can describe it is um, I've been kind of watching some of the emails that the, my next guest sends out, and a lot of it resonates with my old military sense, and maybe that's because he's an old military sense kind of guy. And um, I'm, we're really going to end up doing probably 10 or 20 shows with him because there's really just so much to talk about that I find so interesting. But anyway, our, our guest today is um, Dan Gowen, and he is a um, uh, 50 pound brain, for, among other things, but uh, one of those guys who has just gotten his hands into so many different things from computer software design and development for microgrids and grids to weaponry to all kinds of stuff. And he has such a great, huge picture of the energy world. And that's his business, right? Or one of his businesses right now. So Dan, I just want to thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate it. And uh, I'd like to, uh, using your own words, you could tell the audience a little bit about your background and, um, what you do right now with your current personal business and your uh, your um, energy company? Sure. So, so I'm one of those people that, that I, I have um, RF. I've written RFC. So, those of you who don't know what an RFC that's request for comment. Those are internet standards. So, I'm one of the people that came out of the ARPANET project. Um, I uh, worked mainly out of the Crane Naval Surface Warfare Center during the '90s, and I did. Uh, 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 mainly development was on the network time protocol, GPS, JDAM, ran Tomahawk for a lot of years, did Trident too. And after I left the Department of the Navy, um, I ended up going into the public utility sector at a place called Indianapolis Power and Light here in Indianapolis and pretty much just automating everything that was bolted down. The project after IPL was a place called Midcontinent ISO, and that's an independent systems operator. So. So I'm the guy that designed the computer system that controls the power grid for about 26 states and parts of Canada. And that was a three-year project for mail, eight-hour weeks, that kind of, kind of move. Uh, after that, I did work for General Electric, and that was the alternative fuels program that was burning hydrogen. And that was anywhere from an LM600 to the 9.8, the huge 900, uh, 9HA, which is 557 megawatt gas turbine. And Probably one of the few people that have had the honor of melting a gas turbine down with hydrogen. So, uh, and after that, uh, spent about eight years working for Lilly, uh, designing financial system, vaccine lines, uh, warehousing, that type of thing. Type of thing. Probably the last seven years, I've wandered off into the corporate world. So either I'm junior partner in on uh, one or two corporations, and this corporation is mainly focused on hydrogen. Now, as far as how electron power technology, how this thing started, it started about 10 years ago. And uh, there were a couple of directors. One is a guy by the name of Dr. Michael Bridge, who's out of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory out of Wright Patterson. Him, and there's another gentleman by the name of Dr. Jerry, uh, uh, by the name of John Holmes, a retired director out of Redstone Arsenal, and another guy by the name of Jerry McFarlane that basically called on me to sort of crack a lot of the um, hydrogen energy problems. And there's been a mystery with hydrogen that's been a problem for probably close to 200 years, and it has to do with compression and storage. And that was to figure out exactly what is hydrogen brittlement, why are certain materials permeable to hydrogen, others aren't, figure out what materials that we can safely and effectively use with hydrogen, how to build valves that are practice so code and figuring out how to build valves that are molecularly tight at the quantum level. And these are devices you could scale the, the diameter of a semi-truck tire if necessary. And more importantly was designing how to compress hydrogen, not using mechanical systems. And so for right now, right right now the electron hydrodynamic compressor, we're top 
we talk about it, about 57,000 PSI and the machine can move cubic kilometers of gas. So it's a machine designed for scale and it's designed for energy storage and for storing ener uh, energy on for the power grid and to take advantage of a lot of the excess generation we've got out of the power grid. That's outstanding. In fact, I, I've come to the conclusion uh, after talking to you a little bit today that we're going to have one program just focused on hydrogen compression and storage. And we're just going to dedicate the whole show to that because I agree with you that that's the one nut. If there's anything in hydrogen that I find as a negative, it's compression and the ancillary is storing it after it's compressed. So that will be a great show all by itself. But what really captures me about the work that you do and the emails that I see is that you have such a good grasp on not just hydrogen and not just nuclear power and not, you know, not just any one or two aspects of energy. You kind of have the economic and global picture of the political ramifications, the, the um, national security ramifications of dealing with energy at the global scale. And I know that's a huge subject, so we're obviously not going to tap into it today, but it's one that I really wanted to start to focus on today. And, and so could you kind of give us your picture of the current state of oil and natural gas as our current stock and trade in energy and transporting it and um, the economic pieces that are tied in there? And, and we'll get into that discussion a little bit. But if you could just kind of get us started on that as a, as a, as a topic, I, that'd, that'd be great. Well, there's a there's a bigger uh, a bigger issue here, and it's something that's not it's not effectively talked about. And unfortunately, and I think you and I stand we're talking about. Unfortunately, some of it has been trapped in some of the politics of the day, and the politics of the left and politics of the right. And there's a truth that has nothing to do with either one of those ideas. As well. And it's a, something I first encountered uh, dealing with coal-fired power plants. Now. The reason why I, I intimately know about a lot of this stuff is understand I'm the guy that sits down with the accountants and the lawyers, and I turn like legal concepts into software, right? So I'm the guy that builds the spot markets, the future market. So I have to have a, a really good gap, grasp on how a lot of these things work to put all those pieces together. So one of the things that's happened to coal fired power plants, and, and the public has the impression that coal-fired power plants have, are being replaced with gas turbines. And the reality is very different. And it's not the wind farms replacing the gas turbines, and it's not the coal-fired power, and it's not the gas turbines replacing coal-fired power plants, and it's not wind farms replacing coal-fired power plants. Really what's happened, it has to do with the quality of the fuel, quality of the coal. So as the, the high carbon content coal has been depleted, understand the coal miners, they mine out the highest quality material first, and they leave the other stuff to later. Now, even though the United States probably has, you know, 300 years or 400 years worth of coal, the part they neglect to say is they neglect to say that a majority of that is the stuff called lignite, which is less than 40% carbon content. It's, it's brown coal, right? In the business, we call it burning dirt. Well, the problem with using that type of fuel is you can quickly see that you're going to expend moisture, energy, and mining it, transporting it, just transporting material that, that doesn't provide energy, right, in your coal-fired power plant. And so the quality of the coal affects that business, the coal-fired power plant, and how they can sell energy. And then when you're competing with something like wind, what happened over the number of years is the wind farms have become incredibly efficient. And, uh, right, so the public has this opinion that, the coal-fired power plant was replaced by the gas turbines. Reality was, is that we had a building there. We removed the coal-fired power plant. We put a gas turbine in there. And the reason why is because there are gaps in the power grid. And one of the things I can fire up and provide 557 megawatts of power is a gas turbine. I can fire that up in 15 minutes. And that's why it's in there. It's not because it's running all the time. It's because it's something I can produce huge amount of power and, and put it there. Now, the fossil fuel business um, has the same problem. So you talked about oil and natural gas. What most people don't realize about this is that natural gas is a byproduct of oil production. If those guys aren't out there drilling for oil, you don't get natural gas. 
And the reason why is because what they're looking for is oil. They, they make very little money on natural gas. And the reason why is by the time you put in all the infrastructure to take advantage of natural gas to put it on the gas grid, right? There's very little profit because of all the hardware you've had to invent. The capex is really high. All the hardware you've had to put in. Uh, one of the great examples I have when you talk about, for example, if you're, because uh, they're, they're my customers, Vector and Centerpoint and all those different companies, is when they're pumping gas from Texas all the way up to Ohio, they expand almost 30% of the quantity of that gas in the pipeline just pumping up there. So every 20 or 30 miles is a pump station. They tap into that gas and burn some of that gas to power the pumps. So you have this quality and efficiency issue, and these things start compounding and starts affecting the economics. Uh, when it comes to the Middle East, uh, we've got we the easiest way I can describe it, whether it's the Middle East or whether it's here in the United States or anywhere in the world, the really great quality, the easy to get at, the 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 easiest to refine fuel has been consumed, and what's left behind is the fuel that either is hard to get at, meaning is it's 3,000 feet down, requires billions of dollars worth of equipment to go out in the middle of the ocean to grab at, right? Or it's oil that has has problems with it, meaning it's got a lot of sulfur. There's a lot of things you have to do to it to refine it. And it's something that's usable like diesel and gas. And which means that the, the cost of refining it goes up and up and up and up. So the entire fossil fuel business has this quality right now when i talk to people about this i'll tell you i'll be honest really honest with you. there's plenty of oil in the, world. the question is what are you willing to pay for and that's where you get into these economics because we know that whenever gasoline is five six seven eight dollars a gallon people just plain stop right you know, and when fuel prices that high, I'm sorry, but the reality is a lot of people start start looking really warmly at that horse versus their car. And that's just reality. So even though, for example, the folks in Saudi Arabia, they'd love to be selling oil at $150, $200. They know they'll never get there because nobody will pay for the fuel. That's just reality. You know, let me interrupt for just a second and, and, and bring up two points that we talked about before too. When it comes to the coal, um, it's not just using coal as a fuel for uh, burning for power, but the best coal is used in other industries as well. And you mentioned steel production being one of them. So not only are you running out of the best coal that gives you the best bang for the buck on energy production, you're competing with other industries that need that specific kind of coal in their production of steel. Otherwise, they have to also look at higher cost options to make their steel. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, that's why you've got, for example, blast furnaces, rather than using coal to melt steel, either they're using electric arc, and a lot of them are looking really closely at hydrogen. And that could almost be a story, a, a show in and of itself, how in a lot of respects, you're better off actually using hydrogen to make steel than to use in using an electric arc. And as time, because of the quality of the coal, which affects what we call coking coal or high quality pure carbon for making steel. And one of the things that's been going on, for example, in Germany, they've been firing up some of these blast furnaces using hydrogen. And the reason why everybody's watching that is because the steel, the quality of the steel coming out of Germany and out of places like Sweden is some of the highest quality steel in the world. And if you want to know why, it's because when you're using hydrogen from an electrolyzer, that hydrogen is 99% pure. So there just aren't any impurities in that steel. In fact, all the impurities in that metal are what they're adding to the metal versus oh, I'm fighting against how to remove the impurities out of it. So, and then, yeah. Go ahead. And then no, another, no. another thing that, um, that struck me as we talked about the international side of like natural gas, um, a few a few months ago, I remember reading something from you that said that because the American um, natural gas industry had done so much capital expenditure on infrastructure, and you mentioned just now that the cost of getting natural gas was the big the big cost was capital expenditure up front to build the infrastructure. That when all of a sudden the world market um, went 
imploded a little bit price-wise on the cost of natural gas, we were actually out outperformed price-wise by Russia and other countries to the tune where our own companies that were producing natural gas in the U.S. couldn't compete because their natural gas was too expensive compared to other nations. Is that could you expound on that a little yeah. bit? That implication. Yeah. That, that's all true. Well, the, the reasons why are very simple. If we're going to ship natural gas to the other side of the world, we're, we're expending some of that natural gas to liquefy and turn it into natural gas and put it on a ship. If you're competing with Russia, now, one of the aspects most people don't realize about, it, realize about Russia is Russia when you, has something like 1.4 quadrillion cubic meters of gas in reserves. So compared to the United States, we're like 334 trillion. But the Russians are 1.4 quadrillion. So if you took Russia and understand their customers are right there, they're a pipeline away. They don't have to liquefy it. They just have you know, pipelines. The Russians, if you took the 2020 consumption of the world consumption of natural gas alone, the Russians by themselves could supply the planet Earth with 48 years worth of natural gas. And number two on that list is Iran. And right now, there's this unholy trend between China, Russia, and Iran that's going on. And between that, that, that group right in there, to be, the truth is, it's just looking on just killing pure reserves of natural gas, oil, and so forth. Between those three, they're probably going to control the petroleum world for probably the next 100 years. Unfortunately, that's the truth. And it's because the Russians have so much natural gas, they can almost literally dump it on the market. And their customers are right there because they're just a pipeline away versus we're having to liquefy it and ship that stuff overseas. That, that brings up um, one, of the, one of the images that I wanted to put up, and that's the one of the, uh, the pipelines in the Middle East. And you sent us a map, if we could throw that up, Eric. Could you talk to us a little bit about the China um, Belt and Road project and, and how that kind of ties together in this energy picture and impacts the U.S. in terms of energy and finances. Um, sure. We talked a little bit about, you know, U.S.'s currency is the strongest in the world, arguably, but we're getting competition now. And how does all of this stuff play into that? Well, well first of all, what's on that map there, there's a, a new pipeline. Now, what it, there was a negotiation, there was an agreement that was negotiated over several years and it's, there's a 25, the Chinese have a 25 year deal with Iran and primarily where the Chinese provide uh, financing infrastructure. The, the uh, Russians have been providing the oil field services, pipelines, oil refineries and so forth. And when I talk to people about this, they sort of scoff at the capabilities of the Russians. I said, wait a minute here. You realize that, you know, who put the first uh, synthetic, uh, you know, orbital thing in orbit, who put the first man in orbit around the planet? wasn't us, right? So don't scoff at Russian science and engineering, okay? But that 25-year deal that the Chinese have with the Iranians, uh, part of that was, uh, part of that whole agreement, there's a, a SOFR agreement, that's a status of forces agreement. So that means that as of the second week of November of last year, the Chinese military set up bases in Iran. And the Russians are there with them because there's a lot of legal grants between those two countries. Now, what does that mean? Well, remember that there are five permanent members on the UN Security Council. That's Russia, China, England, France, and the United States. And now two of those members have military bases in Iran. So what does that mean, how you're going to deal with Iran? You're probably not going to be able to do much to them because the, the Chinese and the Russians are already in that country. Now, as part of that deal, that pipeline you, you've got right there, that is an oil pipeline. It starts up near where the Tigris and Euphrates drain into the Persian Gulf up near Kuwait, and it ends on down past the Straits of Hormuz down on the uh, Arabian Sea, right? And it's right near the Pakistani border. Now, what most people don't understand about this is that their, the Belt and Roads Initiative is that, for example, uh, I think there's some really good videos out there on YouTube where you got this guy, he's from Belgium, and he actually travels from Belgium or from Amsterdam and takes the train all the way to Beijing, right? And he does it like 10 days. So you can take, and that railroad actually goes through the northern part of Iran, right, right into China. So most people don't realize 
that the western border of China is with Pakistan, from Pakistan directly into Iran. Now, as part of that, you go out on YouTube, and if you type in China, Pakistan, you'll find this documentary from DW, and that's a, a public um, uh, entity there in Germany that do documentaries. It works for, sort of like our PBS here in the United States. But they have a documentary, it's a two-part documentary, where they talk about that there's a two-lane highway with tunnels that go from China through the Himalayas, through Pakistan, and meet up with that port down there um, on the, uh, the, Arabian, the Arabian Sea there, right? Not only that, but the Chinese, as of two years ago, were building a freeway through there. And understand, we're talking about so they can drive semi-trucks and cars at 70 miles an hour from China, through the Himalayas, through Pakistan, all the way down to Persia, down to the, the Indian Sea there. The, uh, the Arabian Sea, I'm sorry. Uh, but the point being is, and if, once they finish it up, it's just a hop, skip, and jump before there's a railroad line in there. And that means the Chinese are going to start moving oil into China. And more likely, the odds are that they'll end up building that oil refinery there in the western part of China, out there in the middle of that desert where there's nothing at. They'll turn that into refined product, load that onto, onto their bullet trains that are electric trains and move at 300 miles an hour and travel the entire lake of China. And the points being is, A, you just look at that pipeline. First of all, the, uh, the, the Straits of Hormuz, sir, uh, pretty much the US Navy, United States Navy, some point is going to be asked to leave because they're not necessary. Because the Iranians are renting space out of that pipeline to anybody who wants to pay it. So if you look closely at that map, there's direct connections up in Iraq and Kuwait. And of course, the, the Saudis are right next door. So they're going to move you know, oil and gas through there. Right now, as of June, there's one pipeline, which is just a matter of time. There'll be multiple pipelines. And according to what the, I think Rystad Energy is saying, is that pipeline right now is moving about 6 million barrels of oil a day. But eventually, whenever they, the Chinese finish up with that Belt and Road is going through Pakistan, that uh, the Chinese will have access to the Middle East and they don't need the Straits of Malacca. Basically, they don't need the, basically Singapore. And so whenever that happens, the tac any kind of tactical advantage we thought we had against China all disappear. Okay. We, we yeah. talk in the military about lines of communication. And for most people, that just means telephone lines and internet connections, but it actually means shipping lines of communication. And what you're just talking about is the fact that right now, the entire world for commerce and especially for oil um, uses that region you're talking about to ship basically the blood the blood of the uh, world's economy and the world's industries uh, back and forth between Asia and the Middle East will now long no longer be necessary. And like you say, Singapore will be impacted. Um, a lot of the shipping in that region will will disappear. And therefore, the reason for the United States military to protect that shipping will evaporate. So there's some huge national security implications, not to mention the fact that now that we have the uh, northern part of the, um, the, the uh, Western Asia um, tied in with Pakistan and China and the Middle East with Iran and Afghanistan and you know keep on going. Um, you have all new dynamics in the political stage, international political stage, that we have to consider in all our calculus as we start dealing with energy. One of the bigger things here, there's a country that's just north of that area, it's sandwiched between Russia and China, is a place called Azerbaijan. What most people don't know is something like 70 to 80 percent of the world, world's uranium comes from that country. And guess where they're sandwiched right between? Russia and China. Yeah. And the Chinese use a lot of Russian technology for, for nuclear power. And so, so here we've got two major powers in the world that have, uh, well, you know, between, between the Iranians, um, if, you, if you looked at, for example, from the tip of the Asian, uh, tip of the Arabian Peninsula, uh, uh, basically an ellipse, right, bisecting the, the Arctic Circle, at that area, in other words, it goes from from the tip of the uh, uh, the Arabian the Arabian Peninsula all the way up, you know, into Russia. That whole area right here, you're talking something like seventy eight percent of the world's reserves 
of hydrocarbons right there in that area. And those are going to be tied up by those countries. One of the things that's been going on is China has some of the largest integrated oil refineries in the world that they that they've been bringing online. India does also, but we're looking at a situation where they're going to have direct access to that fuel. One of the things that's been going on in the international market is uh, China, and to some extent in India, but mainly China, has been dumping diesel and gasoline on the international market. And one of the uh, things that's caused, for example, right now, they put uh, most of the refining capacity in Australia out of business. So come January of 2022, Australia will have one oil refiner, one. And we've lost the number of refining capacity here, and Europe is down down into single digit when we come to oil refiners. And all they're, they're replacing with just import terminals because, so unfortunately, we're probably looking at a situation where probably within the next five or 10 years, we're going to be importing fuel from our enemy. And that's a scary thought. Uh, and that brings up, you know, as we go into our last minute, um, the point that, um, you know, can the, the question I started off the program uh, title with was, you know, can the U.S. be energy independent? And, you know, I think we're going to have to do a second show and just talk about that. Um, both of us kind of agree that it's possible. But right now, when the, the ground rule, the ground picture that I set today was how critically important it is for the United States to get on top of this stuff because the rest of the world is moving and we're falling behind. And, and I think that's probably where we're going to have to leave the discussion today. But I'll leave the last minute up to you to just kind of close with. Well, I, I think you've hit the nail, uh, hit, hit the head on the nail, and that is exactly it. And I think this whole tragedy we've seen unfold, unfortunately, whereas Afghanistan, everybody's now realizing how important Afghanistan was because it was one of the few places that was sandwiched between Iran and Pakistan. And now with that whole thing sort of crumbling, right, we're going to be left with this reality. I'm not, and we've known this reality has been playing itself out, but we're, we're going to reap, unfortunately, have to reap the rewards of what's going to Well, Dan, I really appreciate you uh, being on today. And uh, I hope the audience uh, has gotten an, an equal appreciation for the, the level that you think at and work at, you know, for your companies. And, and you know, um, I really do. I've gotten a lot reading of, you know, the information you send out. And I really hope you can come back on a future show or two or three or four or 10. And um, we'll talk about some of these other issues. But um, I think that's going to do it for us today. And I, I really want to thank you. Appreciate it. Sounds good. All right. So until next Tuesday, this is Stan the Energy Man signing off from the beautiful megalopolis of Kailua. And we'll see you next uh, week Tuesday on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha.